This is Jack Carr, author of The Terminal List and True Believer, wishing Talking Lead a happy 300th episode and looking forward to another 300 and even more. Lead heads, we are back with another episode of the Talking Lead Podcast. This is episode 311, 311. And as promised, we have a very special guest for you, Lead Heads, this episode. But before we introduce him, I want to introduce my co host, and it is fellow Lead Head, Jason Farmer. Jason, welcome in. Thanks, Thanks for listening. It's uh, good to be on the show today. Yeah, man. Glad to have you. So you're kind of responsible for, for the show today. Uh, not kind of. You are responsible for the show today. You took uh, took the lead and made this happen, and uh, we greatly appreciate that. So uh, I'm going to leave the honors up to you to introduce our very special guest. All right. Well, uh, the, the guest today is going to be Jack Carr, and he is uh, a Navy SEAL and also an author of uh, two books uh, I have more more that he wants to talk about but I know him from the terminal list and the new book that just came out True Believer True. and he's uh, also it, the wearer of an awesome beard now I'll take that I'll take it Jack welcome yeah. into the Talking Red Podcast bro. thank you so much for having me on it's awesome to be here really appreciate it yeah man we know that you are on a whirlwind tour right now and uh, I mean it, it's very awesome that you took the, the time to to spend with the lead head and let us introduce you to the talking lead lead head brigade it's an honor to be here yeah but it's been busy it's crazy you don't really anticipate all that stuff at the get-go you think you just write a book send it to the publisher and they put it out there and then you do another one and that's it <laughs> and live in the mountains in a cabin and you're good you didn't know but, there's uh, any more work behind it huh? <laughs> yeah there's a lot more to it than that it's just like anything you do starting a small business really and all everything that goes along with that and all the, the branding and co-branding and marketing and social media and brand building stuff it's uh it's insane it's a lot more to it than i thought and this tour has been great but it's uh it's definitely been busy and between all the book signings then there's interviews and podcasts and tv appearances and all that stuff so it's a it's a very work. very good problem to it's have work, if you're work, in this work. industry yeah oh, and that's great no i love every minute and you, you're you're kind of new to this. I mean, relatively new. Your first book was yeah. published last year, The Terminal List. Yep. Huge success. Right. Uh, I mean, even then, I was getting getting uh, emails from our listeners saying, "Hey, you got to get Jack Carr on. You got to get Jack Carr on." I was like, you know, kept meaning to look Who's into he? it and, and and do it and do it. <laughs> well, I'd heard of you, um, you know, through through our network and and people. We've had sure. other Navy SEALs on the show before, and uh, you know, they've right. mentioned you. Uh, Jay Redmond, do you know Jay? Yeah, we just met in person for the first time not too long ago. But uh, great dude. Yeah, of course I knew knew who he was, and we had many mutual friends. Um, but yeah, yeah, great guy. Yeah, so we've had him on Jared Ogden, you know Charlie Melton, yeah, uh, yeah, a whole whole slew of of people that we probably know that we don't know. Um, I'm sure. I'm sure that's how this works. That's but how this community works. It took it took Jason Farmer, you know, a dedicated listener to the show, uh, to to make it happen. And, and Jason, thank you so much for doing that. Problem. Yeah, I appreciate it. it. So I'm, it out. I'm new. I'm new to the Jack Carr world, uh, but you know I've been doing some research on you, and uh, you know the Terminal List sounds like an awesome book. Talk about talk about what kicked it all off. What started it for you with the Terminal List? Yeah. So growing up in the '80s, there was really anything written about seals, and there's a couple things here and there, and I found out what they were very early on at age seven. And my mom was a librarian, so she took every opportunity that she could to take us down to the library and teach us how to research using, back then, the Dewey Decimal System, and uh, really just get us around books. And we grew up with this love of reading. And back then, there was a couple things nonfiction, a couple mentions in a couple magazines and books, but not, not much. You could, you could actually read it all back then. You couldn't just Google Navy SEAL and have an unending supply of information right. pop up that you could never possibly sift through. But back then, you could actually read everything written. Um, 
And then a lot of what I learned came from the pages of fictional thrillers. So I was reading early and just always loved it and gravitated towards books with protagonists who had backgrounds that I wanted to have one day. So authors like Tom Clancy and Nelson DeMille, David Morrell, A.J. Quinnell, J.C. Pollock, these guys typically had protagonists that had Vietnam experience in special operations and then maybe had moved on to intelligence agencies. Right. And so I was just drawn to these works and loved reading them and knew that one day after my time in the military, uh, I would write the books that I enjoyed reading growing up. So, so that's really is, where it started for me back then. It's always been a goal of yours to be, to be a writer, to be an author. Yep, exactly. And I knew I wanted to be a SEAL from a very early age uh, as well. And my grandfather, I think it's because my grandfather was killed in World War II. So I grew up with pictures of him and his airplane, uh, Corsair, yeah. um, the silk maps they gave aviators back then so they wouldn't disintegrate when you hit the water like a paper map would, uh, his medals, his wings, uh, that sort of thing. So I grew up with him. And then there's that show on TV, Black Sheep Squadron with Robert Conrad. Oh, yeah. Uh, that was awesome. And uh, so I grew up, I just knew I was, it was a calling. Just like writing is a calling, going into the military was a calling, and I knew that would happen first. So um, really, what happened was that foundation of reading those novels that I read growing up, and then going into the military and really academically studying insurgencies and terrorism, and then the experience on the battlefield in Iraq and Afghanistan kind of all came together at the right time and place as I moved into this uh, next profession. And all of that that has made me what I am today is now finding its way into the pages of these novels. So yeah. I feel extremely fortunate to have, have done one thing that I, that I wanted to do my whole life and to now be doing the other. Yeah. So, so to know that early on, you know, to know that you wanted to be a, a writer, to know that you wanted to be part of the, the U.S. military, special forces, um, I mean, that was, a, that was very advantageous for you because I'm sure as you're going through your career and you're like, you know, you're thinking – career, things I'm doing, book, you're taking notes, you've got, I'm sure you've probably got memoirs at the ass, right? <laughs> well, now, you know, not really. Uh, they were kind of separate and distinct in my head. And uh, while I was in the military, I was focused on the mission, focused on on the guys. I came in enlisted because I wanted to uh, be a sniper, and I knew that typically officers weren't snipers. Uh, I wanted to essentially start in the mailroom, work my way up, uh, learn the trade, establish a reputation. And then once more, the influence of popular culture on me uh, back in the 80s, every single Vietnam movie or TV show, they always had some officer showing up in Vietnam right. that would make the guys shave, get haircuts, <laughs> start saluting, and then he would march them right into an ambush. Yeah. Like That was the thing. And I said, I don't want to be that guy. So I always knew I was coming in enlisted and then did uh, about six and a half years into it, then went to OCS and right back to the SEAL teams as an officer and then finished up in 2016 and off to the races on the, the next chapter in life. You didn't want to be a Lieutenant Sobel. <laughs> From, from Which one was he in? Band of Brothers, uh, oh, the guy the who was on Friends. <laughs> yeah, horrible. David oh Schwimmer. Gosh. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. But, well, there's another book, and it's um, it's called Once an Eagle by Anton Meyer, and it was written in 1968. And it's essentially an anti-war novel, almost, but it's historical fiction, but it's really a case study in leadership. And I'd gift it to my junior officers or to my senior enlisted guys, and uh, well, really anybody that, uh, that showed an interest. And I would give it to them because it's a case study in leadership. And what it does is juxtapose two officers as they start their time in the military pre-World War I. And then one, well, one's enlisted first, gets a battlefield commission in World War I. And it juxtaposes their time in service up to Vietnam. And the officer that has never been enlisted is, is, a, is a political animal, essentially. Yeah. And he's always one step kind of politically ahead of the prior enlisted guy who you identify with as the reader and want to be like. Um, and yeah, I, could, I, I would write a letter to my guys in the front kind of explaining why I was giving them this book. And then I had told them in that letter that there's another one at the very back that's sealed. And that has my perspective, my take on what they just read. So if they make their way through this book, which is fairly thick, so you can use it as a doorstop sure. or a weapon if you need to, <laughs> uh, it's, uh, they, they get to that end and they can read the letter from, from me, my, my take on what they just went through. So, cool. um, yeah, all, all very influential stuff for me. Yeah, very cool. Uh, also joining us uh, now, we have uh, another Navy sniper. We've got Charlie Melton joining us, ladies and gentlemen. Charlie, welcome in. What's up? <clears throat> What's up, Marty? Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Uh, glad that you could take time from, from building your new house to join us. <laughs> uh, no, I was digging a separate thing. Lost track of time. Well, that that happens when you're you're digging the sh you're digging the shitter, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, uh, Jack, this is Charlie. Charlie, Jack, 
Charlie, what's happening? Thanks for joining us. Yeah, what's up, Jack? Yeah, I don't How's know if going? we or not. I don't know. I don't think we, I'm All not right. sure. I went through, uh, yeah, sniper school back in 2000 um, in the enlisted East days. Coast. And uh, What's that? East Coast or West Coast? West Coast, so at Kalinga. Okay, yeah, I ran sniper school on the West Coast for a while right after they stopped going to Kalinga after old Mike Ridling got the... Or those guys got the uh, that spur disease or whatever in their lungs. Oh yeah, Indy got that. Uh, what is it? Valley fever, I think it was something like that. Yeah, a couple guys got it, so they stopped going there for a while. But uh, yeah, very cool. So uh, I thought it'd be awesome to have a, a sniper ask a sniper questions, you know, for his book and stuff. So, <laughs> um, but before we get in, we're going to ask you more questions, Jack. Uh, we want to talk. We want to hear more about Terminal List, but we want to hear about your new book, True Believer. Which uh, I can only imagine that it's probably double, triple, uh, doing better than the terminal list. So, um. yeah, no, it's very, uh, very fortunate. Uh, and where that first book was really a book of revenge without constraint. And the way I picked it is that I wrote down six or seven different ideas, uh, and I picked the one that I thought would resonate the most with people, most with readers. Yeah. And that was that one, the, the theme of revenge, because I loved reading books like that growing up. I loved going to movies that had that theme. And I mean, there's a reason why there's so many Death Wish movies. I mean, there's something about <laughs> reading or watching a movie and Rambo, doing things Death that you wish, wish you could yeah. do. Yeah, you wish you could do it in real life, but you know, if you did, you'd be thrown in jail and executed. So you can't, but you can escape into the pages of a novel or you can sit down in a theater and escape for a couple hours and watch somebody else do those things that would normally get you thrown in jail or killed in real life. Absolutely. So I, I picked that one very intentionally right off the bat. And then the second one takes off, picks up where the other one left off. And the second one I like to call a novel of violent redemption. So the protagonist from the first book, who happens to be a former Navy SEAL sniper uh, turned officer that uh, is involved in a conspiracy of the testing of drugs on our nation's most elite soldiers, which I got from the church hearings in the 70s where they actually did that sort of thing to people in mental institutions, um, uh, hospitals, university students, members of the military without really their consent. And so I thought, hey, what if we brought this back and someone didn't get the memo and they did it again and there were some side effects that needed to be quashed and somebody figures it out and essentially becomes the terrorist or the insurgent that he'd been fighting for the past 16 years and brings the tactics and techniques that worked against us in Iraq and Afghanistan to home soil against those that had uh, kicked off this conspiracy and these tests. So that was the first one. And the second one, I knew it's a continuation of the journey because we're all on this journey. We're all, we're all going through transitions. We're all find, looking for that purpose in life. And when you find it, it's an amazing thing. You find that purpose, find that mission. And in this particular case, the protagonist needed to learn how to live again. And in 2006, I was working in Iraq um, and I was working with what can best be described, I guess, as a covert action unit. And the, we worked with an Iraqi officer who was really a head and shoulders above his peers in that he was a very sound tactical battlefield leader. And it was during the time of the Golden Mosque bombing, so where the Sunni Shia rift really came to the forefront and threatened to rip the country apart even further than it already was. And we had some interesting times in Baghdad 2006. And years later, I got word that he disappeared. And so I thought, what if I was to make this a lot more interesting, have him resurface in Europe, disgruntled that we left at the end of 2011, having been trained by the CIA and Special Operations Forces, and now taking that training and those skills and using them against the Western world. And the protagonist, James Reese, who had befriended this guy in Iraq, now is found by the U.S. government and sent to bring his former friend to justice. So that really is really where the action kicks off in True Believer. Very good. Very good summary of the two books there. And we want to ask you more questions about those. But uh, I hear the jack wagon train rolling in. So, Gunny, bring that Uh train in. Hoorah, Semper Fi, do or die, hold them high at 8th and I. It is time for the talking lead jack wagon of the week. So, brace yourself, baby. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So, the train has stationed. And we've got a few. We're not going to do do all the jack wagons this week. Uh, I know you guys have sent in a lot of jack wagons over the last couple of weeks. Um, uh, we're going to touch on a few. But we want to get more in, into jack. So let's go ahead and knock these jack wagons out. And uh, I know that, Mr. Farmer, you've got a couple that you're going to kick us off with. I do. Uh, the first one comes from Deland, Florida. and uh, The land? I, the land. Sorry. And um, that's where Big Three East is. You've heard me talk about that before. Oh, I have. I have. Delay and Tiger Bay. I didn't didn't put the two and two together. Oh, there but, you uh, go. That's but, a good. That's uh, a good. Uh, a good. Good event. <laughs> yes, it is, awesome. and uh, it's coming up soon. Right. Yeah. 
Uh, go ahead with your Jack Wade. No, but the one, but the one that um, we see a lot of squirrels on this show, Jack. Just <laughs> so you right. Know, just, I get just, it. Jump in and comment whenever you want to. All right, but so go so ahead, this Jason. Jack Wagon that I want to nominate um, has been poisoning beekeepers' bees. So he's been poisoning honeybees. What? Uh, right. Yeah, man. I mean, honeybees of all things. Um, oh, people don't you. realize how important honeybees are. Uh, and pollination, and I think I've read somewhere that uh, honeybees are responsible for pollinating uh, enough plants to produce about three out of every five bites of food that we take. So <laughs> yeah, I mean they're very essential to have, our ecosystem. Must not have kids. He must not have kids because he must not have seen the bee movie. That that's that it. spells it out pretty clearly <laughs> in that bee movie. That's right. So so the owner of the bees, the beekeeper Horace Bell told the Daytona Beach News Journal that he found uh, dead bees all over his property when he went to check his hives. And now he's offered a $30,000 reward for information leading to the arrest of the person or the people responsible for poisoning the bees. Okay, there you go. So we don't have a motive yet. No motive. Uh, but uh, this particular individual had about 20,000 hives in Florida spread out, and about 1,000 of those uh, were in the apiary where... They were killed by the poison. So, oh my gosh, so we have we have means and opportunity, but no motive. Right. No what, motive. What, what do you what do you poison bees with? <laughs> um, I, I'll probably say pesticide, some type of pesticide, or um, uh, uh, yeah, seven, right. seven dust, anything that's used to um, to kill insects from gardens and things like that. Man, I know that's, that's going to be an interesting. So you need to keep us up to date on that one. Cause we'll do. Hopefully, they'll find the individuals. Find involved. the mystery of that. Yeah, definitely. All right, our next one comes to us from. I don't have the date line. Anyway, it's FBI found a bucket of human heads, body parts sewn together like Frankenstein, at a donation facility. Uh, Phoenix. Here wow. we go. This happened in Phoenix. So a lawsuit filed against a body donation center in Arizona has revealed disturbing news. Uh, about an FBI raid at the facility. The civil suit filed this week claims the FBI found buckets of body parts, a cooler filled with male genitalia, and the bodies of different people sewn together at the facility. Oh, my gosh. Wow. I mean... You can't make that up. It's, you know, again, that's one you couldn't even make up. Truth. The truth is stranger than fiction. If you read that in a fictional novel, you'd be like, no way. It says, in a newly released testimony, one agent claimed he found a cooler filled with male genitalia, a bucket of heads, arms, and legs, uh, infected heads, and a small woman's head sewn into a large male torso like Frankenstein hanging up on the wall. Oh, my gosh. Wow. This is a horror story. It is just unbelievable, said Terry Harp, who is one of 33 plaintiffs in the lawsuit. Uh, it's absolutely gross. Yeah, it's... Definitely something something out of the ordinary here. So it doesn't go on to talk about any uh, anything else. Um, I guess this is an ongoing case, so uh, until it gets, I guess, solved, we won't hear any more about it. Um, yep. so, somebody somebody hired a serial killer. I don't know, <laughs> man. This is it's weird. I mean, these stories. This came to us from Kenneth McGee. So Leadhead McGee sent that one in. Thank you, Kenneth, for sending that. Uh, another one we've got. There's been a since there's been a rash of drunk airline pilots uh, over the last few weeks. United and Delta both have had pilots that have been arrested for attempting to fly under the influence. Uh, drunk. That's been, that's been going on for years, hasn't it? <laughs> uh, it, it? It actually has. Um, but here's the thing, too, with uh, when you think of drunk, you know, you think of DUIs, people out that, you know, they're like three times over the legal limit. Uh, with a pilot, I think it's like whatever the legal limit is, it's like half of that. If they blow, you know, even that, then they're considered considered drunk. Um, wow. But I've flown with many a drunk pilot, and I think they some of them fly better. <laughs> yeah, it's like that Denzel, Denzel Washington movie. <laughs> Apparently, you got to do cocaine and be drunk to land a plane upside down. <laughs> right. That's, that's what, exactly what I was thinking about. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so that that was a good one. That was 
presented by Elan Hedge. Here's another one. Uh, Pierce Taylor sent this one in. And uh, the U.S. soccer, the women's U.S. soccer team uh, filed a lawsuit. I don't think it was all of them. I think it was just some select members that uh, wage discrimination, that they're getting paid uh, way less than, than their male counterparts. And then an investigation was launched, and it was actually found out that they are getting paid more than the male soccer team. So, <laughs> so the male soccer team is suing. Uh, so I get, yeah, the male, the male's probably going to uh, turn around and sue now, but it's that one, the one girl who was very disrespectful to the, the flag during her celebration. I think she's one of the people behind the lawsuit. So no, um, surprise there who's actually behind this. So there's my candidates. There's our lead heads. Do you have any more, Jason? Um, I, I did have one more. It's a little bit disturbing, not quite as disturbing as the, um, <laughs> sever. <laughs> I don't know if I can take any more disturbing or not, <laughs> but, um, uh, it was also from Florida. I don't know what it is about Florida. All these strange uh, things happen in Florida, you know, Florida, Florida there's, a, uh, there's a lot of, there's a lot of Northern people retired in Florida. Is that what it is? Florida, that's what it is. There's a lot of New Yorkers down there. <laughs> uh, but this one's about a daycare worker. Uh, she was arrested after four one-year-old boys uh, in her care came home with broken legs. And uh, they're trying to get to the bottom of this. So another uh, unsolved one? Another unsolved one. They don't know exactly what happened or why it happened. Of course, with them being so young, they can't really tell what happened and being one years old. But uh, the parents of the four boys were aged between 13 and 21 months. So they were they were very young. Um they don't know exactly what happened, but she's been released on bond, it looks like. So wow. she's waiting trial. Yeah, you're going to be careful who you release custody of your children to. You know? I always want to research that. Yeah, it's, very, it's pretty disgusting. Anybody who can, can harm a child, um, you know, that's just the lowest of the low, I think. Yeah, you probably don't want to let the body part harvester guy baby too. <laughs> no. <laughs> <Right. laughs> <laughs> if, if even if your child care is near it, don't go there. Mm-hmm. Avoid it at all costs. What about you, Charlie? You got any jack wagons? I do not. Got none this um, week. No, uh, no, no builder permit people you want to throw in there, giving you a hard time for your construction out there. <laughs> no, sir. I live in the country. We don't do permits. <laughs> <laughs> Amen to that, brother. What about you, Jack? Oh, yeah. Anybody come to mind? I'm good. I'm in a full-on sprint here for this book tour, so I am. Uh, I'm head down and uh, moving forward. So I, I blow you. by those guys. I I don't know. Well, we, we I'm can't. I'm sure you just look, read any paper or hit any uh, any news thing and find plenty. We we can't be remiss in talking about the the mass shootings that have happened uh, over the past couple of weeks. And uh, I mean, we got to be you know we got to be vigilant on this. We know what's going to come from this. There's going to be all kinds of knee-jerk reactions. Uh, quick band-aid solutions that the the lefts are going to be throwing out there. Uh, and one trend that I've already noticed is that they've jumped all over the El Paso shooting uh, because it fits their agenda. You know, he's he's a, a, a white national, a white supremacist. You know, he fits all their, their check boxes, but you don't hear him talking about the, the guy from Dayton, Ohio, uh, which is the most recent one. And uh, he was a socialist. Uh, he's gonna. He was gonna vote for Elizabeth Warren. He's an atheist. So I mean, you, you gotta you gotta see their agenda. It's plain as day. Be vigilant. Get in touch with your representatives, state, local, federal, and uh, let them know that you're not gonna go for any of these uh, bullcrap, knee jerk legislation plans that they're throwing out there. So yep. that's all I'm gonna say. And about. always, yeah. Go ahead. And always carry a gun. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I mean that exercise your second amendment right. You know, your local laws apply obviously, but where you're legally able to carry, do it. Exercise your rights to do that. Uh, again, I mean we're seeing gun-free zones where these people are attacking the garlic festival for God's sake. A 19-year-old uh, kid goes and, and shoots up uh, a garlic festival. You know, I went to a, a hot air balloon f- festival this weekend. And I guarantee you, on everybody's mind was that, you know, that garlic festival. Um, 
but um, I mean, people were still out there enjoying themselves, having a good time. Don't let this affect your day-to-day -day life, your enjoyment of life. Uh, just be just be aware of your surroundings. Be vigilant. Uh, carry, and not only carry, but train. You know, learn how to use that firearm if you're going to take that huge responsibility on. All right, I'm off right. my soapbox. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're preaching to the choir, the choir with our audience anyway. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, so let's talk about our heroes real quick. Let's get that jack wagon train out of here. We've got uh, a couple of heroes that we want to recognize, and then we're gonna we're gonna get on with Jack here because he's got, uh, like he said, he's head down and he's doing this book tour. So. Air Force One is with you, twelve miles on the ILS X-ray, one six right final. Air Force One, contact Reno Tower, one one eight point seven. Have a good day. Air Force One, push the tower. Good day. Jason, who's your? Who's your Leadhead Brigade hero this week to go fly off on Lead Force One? I just want to uh, mention uh, a veteran of the Battle of the Bulge. He was a veteran who passed away just recently at uh, 94 years old. And uh, his name was Maurice Cole. Um, he was just 20 years old when he fought in the month-long Battle of the Bulge that ended in 1945. He was uh, a resident of Fife Lake. And he was one of the last remaining uh, West Michigan veterans from the battle in which more than 20,000 Allied soldiers were killed. And mm -hmm. Cole is one of 40,000 GIs who were wounded in the, in the battle. But uh, I'd just like to, to nominate him, a little stand-up guy, 20 years old, defending his country back in 1945. Greatest generation, and we're losing them, losing them by the, the handful daily. So if you have the opportunity go and thank a World War II vet, or just spend some time with them. You know, that, that would mean more than anything. Um, you don't even have to talk about their service. Just go spend some time with them. That'd be, that'd be even better. So, yeah, great nomination for Lead Force One there. Uh, we've had a couple of nominations for uh, this gentleman. His name's Glenn Don Oakley. He is, I think he's still active U.S. Army, but he was uh, a hero during the El Paso shooting where uh, he took it upon himself to help uh, a group of children, I guess, that were uh, lost amidst the, the chaos, and he helped them to, to safety. And you guys can, uh, can Google that and, and see his story there. But, uh, yeah, definitely. Glendon Oakley, welcome to Lead Force One and the Talking Lead, Leadhead Brigade heroes. You guys got any heroes you can think of? You want to throw on the Lead Force One before we get it out of here? Yeah, I'll jump on real quick. I was uh, at the UDT uh, SEAL Museum in Fort Pierce, Florida today, which was an amazing experience. And uh, anybody thinking about being a SEAL or that is a SEAL or that has been a SEAL should go through there because I thought I was pretty up on my SEAL history, uh, especially reading everything I could before I before I came in. And uh, so I thought I was pretty good. I learned so much going through that and talking to, to Rick Kaiser, who runs the place now. Um, it, it's, an, it's absolutely amazing. And what, we're, what I learned also, just walking through there, is that we're losing Vietnam veterans at a rate uh, yeah. that is a much... Much, uh, much higher rate than we did uh, World War II veterans mm -hmm. um, and Korean veterans. Um, and so those guys are, are uh, spend some time with them, with them too, regardless of what they did during that time. Uh, it was an interesting time, and they definitely did not come home to, uh, to what we have, uh, which has generally been very supportive. So, um, yeah, it's just remember those guys as a whole and know that we're losing them as well at a, at a much quicker rate than we have lost veterans in the past for whatever reason. So, um, yeah, just thinking about those guys. Yeah, so we had Honor Flight on a few episodes ago, and they they help um, World War II, Korean, and Vietnam veterans uh, organize trips for them to go to Washington to see the monu monuments and memorials. Oh, that's there. great! Yeah, so if you you listeners uh, know anybody in your area, get in touch with Honor Flight, and uh, they can really uh, make a difference in you know hopefully um, their lives. What about you, Charlie? Yep, no, absolutely. Well, I was going to bring out the guy from that shooting. Uh, I was just reading about that this morning. Okay, yeah, that was uh, the Glen Don Oakley guy. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty awesome. You know what was surprising? Like all this training they're doing, they should teach like it should be like part of the curriculum in like middle school and high school, just how to do basic tourniquets and uh, medical saving lives. If they did that, that would save probably save a lot of lives in some of these shooting incidents. 
Well, you know, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because that is something that we stress on this show too, is like, you know, if, if you don't want to take on that responsibility, or even if you do take on that responsibility of being a, a firearm uh, carrier, then, you know, you want to also learn first aid, medical, medical care, because you're going to need that a uh, hundred times sooner than you're ever going to pull your pull your firearm and use your firearm. Uh, best way to save a life right there. And I think definitely. If, 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 you, if you do like the TCCC or combat care or whatever it is, just putting tourniquets on and filling holes with gauze or whatever. Yeah. It saves a lot of life. They say in World War II, yeah, they would have had that training, they wouldn't have lost half the guys. That's it. That's it. And what you're talking about that uh, Honor Foundation, Honor Flight Foundation, bringing those World War II veterans to D.C. to see that memorial. Uh, you guys know Donnie Edwards, former uh, San Diego Charger, has a foundation called the Best Defense Foundation, and uh, they take guys back to the beaches of Normandy, uh, to Iwo Jima. They take guys all over the world oh, back nice. to the battlefield for one last time, and uh, and it's absolutely incredible. It's so moving what they're doing. They're, they have some partnerships with Black Rifle Coffee, and he's just uh, just so dedicated to doing that. It's an, it's an incredible story. He's an amazing guy, and uh, yeah, I mean he's a he's a hero for doing that for that generation, and uh, now for Korean what veterans and Vietnam veterans as well. So it's a it's an amazing thing, and I hope to join him on one of these future flights. Yeah, very cool. And say that organization again. What the name of it? Best Defense. Best Defense Foundation by Donnie Edwards. Okay, very good. Sounds yeah. like another worthwhile organization we need to have on the show. Oh, he's amazing. Absolutely amazing. Very cool. All right, so we, we've yet to come up with a pilot for our Lead Force One. We've got a lot of nominations on who our pilot should be. Uh, some of the newer ones, we've got um, the ghost of Charlton Heston. Not Charlton Heston himself, but the ghost of Charlton Heston. Because uh, he says, and it's from Mark Stevens, he said, imagine how badass Charlton Heston was while he was alive. Uh, can you imagine if he was a ghost, how badass he would be? <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> Chewbacca from Star Wars. Uh, arguably a very good, you know, better than Han Solo pilot. Uh, Han Solo has been nominated, by the way. Um, some of the highlights, John McClane has been... Uh, nominated. Ted Nugent has been nominated. Um, and you guys will appreciate this, Charlie and Jack. Uh, Zapper 21. This happened a few years back, but he was, a, I think, an F-18 pilot, and he drew the sky penis. <laughs> <laughs> I was he the first one that did that. Well, I think he's the first one that got public attention over it, anyway. <laughs> uh, I was just talking about that not that long ago. <laughs> Uh, Gary Sinise, Chuck Norris, John Wayne, uh, Joe Foss, Tammy Joe Schultz, um, Sully, um, Sullenberger. I can't remember his think, first. I think he's got my vote. Is that who you're going to be voting for? I think I'm going to be voting for Sully. Uh, he's the guy that landed in Hudson River. Yeah. Yeah. The, did the movie Tom Hanks, uh, did all that. So we've got a lot, a lot, a lot of nominations here. We're going to do a special show with just you lead heads. I put the call out if you want to be on our our live show that we're going to do where we're going to narrow down our our um, candidates for pilot. Shoot me an email, talkingletgmail.com. I want to be on the show, uh, and that's probably going to be in the next uh, one or two uh, episodes. So hurry up and get those in. I'll make my selection. All right, get that plane out of here. Uh, it's me flying it today, so I'm, I'm going to get it out of here. It's, 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 I knew you were going to go that route. That was based on a true story, wasn't it? Wasn't that a true story, too? I think it was based on one. Yeah, I'll have to find out who that pilot is, and and uh, we may have to throw him on there, too. But we will talk. We will talk more about the Terminal List and True Believer with Jack Carr, the two awesome books that have uh, been getting great reviews. They're on my list to read. Uh, so I'm going to be doing a lot of reading the rest of the summer. So you're talking about the Terminal List. You kind of gave us a high level uh, overview of that, and then you jumped into uh, your new book, True Believer. Uh, your your main character, the protagonist. Yep, James Reese, James former Reese. Navy SEAL sniper that's uh, 
finds himself uh, transitioning to the officer ranks, and when we meet him in the first novel, he's just returning from his last Iraq deployment, and uh, or Afghanistan deployment, and I had just returned from my Iraq deployment, kind of in a similar position, having made the decision now to get out and take care of my family, because if I stayed in, I would not be tactically maneuvering guys on the battlefield anymore, which is what I came in to do. And even if you're, you stay in, even if you're in a leadership position, uh, as an 05, now you're going to be pretty much in a talk in a tactical operation center. So yeah. rarely do. And when one of those guys does go on a mission, the guys are like, Oh geez, uh, you know, why is this guy's going to screw everything up? So, uh, you're not really tactically leading from the front anymore. Uh, you're more administratively leading things, which can be powerful as well. But, uh, you know, I didn't come in to, to do that. So I'd made that decision. So, um, it was time to, time to move on and, and start this next chapter in life. And that's where we meet the, uh, the protagonist as well. But the similarities end there. It's, uh, it's just, uh, you know, writing kind of what I had lived, um, both right. uh, the feelings and emotions behind certain events downrange, and then, of course, the, the tactical aspects of uh, firearms and sniper weapon systems and all that, that a lot of times authors mess up in these kind of novels, and it distracts a little bit from the storyline. Yeah. So, uh, so it was time to, time to get writing. But, uh, but he's the protagonist, and uh, hopefully a guy that people will identify with, like, root for, and want to read more about. Now you've got a lot of a lot of eyes on your books, your novels before you can actually release them, and I think um, saying that Jason's got a question for you. Please do shoot. Yeah, I just had um, had a question about some of the characters in the books, and uh, if they were based on any people, or did that influence that you did, um, did building the characters, writing the characters' stories? Right, right. So some are. Uh, you know, I take the the good traits from people and make them into to good people. And I take the bad traits from a few different people, and make them the uh, the bad people, and sometimes the opposite. Uh, a great guy, I know, might have one little treat that that's going to work really well for a bad guy, and uh, and use that. And then a lot of it's just made up, but it's kind of a a mixture, I would say, of all of that. Yeah. And and the what I was leading to is. Uh saying you had a, a lot of eyes on this book. It, it goes through government eyes before you can actually publish your your books. It goes through the, the Department of Defense, right, before you can... That's right. That's right. So we had some uh, some books that caused a little bit of controversy for not having gone through the DOD review process. And so I had a, a group of lawyers look at it, and I wanted to make sure that I was honoring my former security clearances, even though this was fiction. Um, and the regulation is written in such a way that is very broad by design. And it says any... Thing intended for public release it needs to go through the DOD Department of Office of Pre-Publication and Security Review. That's it. So that could mean anything. That could mean a letter to the editor. That could mean anything. Anything you intend for public release if you've had some of these clearances, yeah. uh, which by design means that they can go after anybody of their choosing if you kind of step out of line. Um, so I submitted, and the first they advertised 30 days. Uh, when I submitted. Now they've since taken that off their website and they don't give a specific time, but when I submitted the first one and the second, it was 30 days. And the first one they got back to me in 45 days, which I thought was pretty good. And for anybody that uh, has been in government, um, that, yeah. that 30 days is fairly aggressive. In 15 days hey. late, hey, that's really de- well that's done. Definitely, that's definitely way better than the VA math. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah, maybe different people. Uh, or maybe some of them came to work for the, the, the DOD uh, pre-publication office for my second book because I submitted that one. And well, in the first one, they took out about 10 different lines. They blacked them out. I kept them blacked out in the novel because I didn't know if you uh, if were to write around them, if that was going to be enough, or you had to resubmit. So I kept them blacked out. That's kind of cool uh, because then that leaves it to the reader's imagination as to what that says. You know, That's cool. Exactly. And it's kind of uh, ridiculous what they took out. But uh, <laughs> the second one uh, submitted, and then I waited, and a month passed, then two months, then three, then four, then five, then six. And creeping up on seven months, they finally got back to me, uh, which means that you had to push the release date from April 2nd to July 30th. So it kind of messed things up there. And, you know, that, that's okay. It's just life in general. But they took out 56, 57 sentences this time and two full paragraphs, uh, which are redacted in the novel. And that sounds like a lot. But when you have a novel that's 135,000 words, it's not that much. But it was interesting what they took out. And they took out the name of a country. And really? I'd never been to this country in uniform. I'd never even talked to anybody in the military that had been to this country. I'd been there previous, before I joined the military, I'd been there so I could describe the streets, the people, the marketplace, the mountains, architecture. And they took out every reference to the country, every reference to the mountains, every reference to the architecture. 
Um, but being the government, they forgot to take out the capital city. Of said <laughs> oh, <country>. wow. <laughs> so uh, know, knowing their intent, I took that out for them. So uh, so that's blacked out in there, too. But uh, it was, it was uh, see, who knows? So if uh, but this time I am going to appeal. Uh, you have a year to appeal. Uh-huh. And if we win on appeal and so far, my lawyers have been able to tie every single sentence they took out except for one to a publicly available government document. So mm. not a Wikipedia, not a New York Times or anything like that, but to a, a publicly available government document. So one would think that that means we have a pretty good chance of winning on appeal. But you never know. This is the government. So when the paperback comes out, if we win, then we'll publish the paperback with the redactions taken out. So people will be able to see what the government didn't want them to see. But I don't want to build it up too much because it <laughs> is fairly ridiculous what they took out. And, and most everybody knows it is all it, anyway. Is it for the True Believer novel or is this a true new believer. one? True Believer. Okay. Uh, no, True Believer. The, the third one you know, I'm polishing up right now, and I'm having my lawyers take a long, hard look at if I actually have to submit this thing because uh, just if you look at that line, that regulation, that's one thing. But usually what people do in, uh, well, in legal circles is yeah. look at something holistically and look at precedent, uh, look at that line, look at past case history um, and that sort of thing. So they'll look at all that stuff and then make a recommendation as to whether I need to submit fiction going forward. So yeah. we shall see. So when you when you wrote this book and you came up with this character, uh, did you have did you have all these stories already laid out and planned, uh, or as as you did the first one, then the second one has come to you, and then now you said you're working on a third one, and as you worked on that second, one, did that third one come to you that way, or did you have all these in your you know, like George Lucas and Star Wars? You know, he had you know all of those episodes already written, and you know, of course, he had to cut them up and into. Yeah, no, I had them uh, in my head of those six or seven different ideas I wrote down. I wrote down executive summaries, essentially, um, some with titles, some without. And they, so the first three, anyway, are ones that were part of those initial ideas. And um, I was always going to write two because uh, there's too many instances of somebody writing a first book that doesn't, doesn't hit, that doesn't uh, resonate. Uh, the example that most people will know is John Grisham. So he wrote A Time to Kill first, and he couldn't give that book away. And it's uh, it's arguably his best work and great novel. But he couldn't give it away. He, he threw away boxes of first editions behind his law office. Um, <laughs> but then he didn't quit. And, you know, just like anything in life, keep moving forward. And uh, he wrote The Firm. And that's the one that took off. That's the one that's optioned for a movie. That's the one that Tom Cruise stars in right. and led to John Grisham novel every year since. And so had he not done that, we wouldn't have The Client. We wouldn't have Runaway Jury. We wouldn't have Pelican Brief. Uh, and he might still be practicing law in some shabby law office somewhere, you know, downtown right. Memphis or something. Um, uh, so I was always going to write two. So I started writing the second one before I'd even submitted the first one to Simon and Schuster. Um, and so, so I've had a long time to work on the, the first two. So this third one will be the first one that I'm on the year deadline for. And from now on, it's one a year, uh, going forward. I, I was, that was another ob- observation I was going to make is that, you know, you, you just released the one last year, 2018, and then you got this one now, 2019. That seemed to me the pretty fast between novels, um, I mean, yeah, that's what they. That's what uh, when you have a recurring character, that's pretty much what uh, that standard. Uh, what what fans want, and that's pretty standard. Yep. So okay. Daniel Silva does it with the Gabriel Alon series. Uh, Brad Thor with his Scott Harbath series. Vince Flynn when he was alive with uh, with his series with Mitch Rapp, now continued by Kyle Mills. So you're on pretty much the one book a year uh, train, which means you you're. It's interesting because you one you write a first one, and that's one. And then you promote the first one, uh, finish the second, start editing. And so you're, editing, you're promoting one, editing a second, writing a third. And pretty soon it'll be promoting one, two, uh, editing a third, writing a fourth. And then it just keeps going. So you just have more balls in the air uh, and, and juggling. And, and, uh, and so it just gets, gets crazier and crazier as you move forward, I think. Yeah, no doubt. And uh, I'm sure you've probably got movies uh, in mind with this, with these. Have you been approached by some studios yeah so it was optioned right off the right off the bat before it even came out and uh unfortunately all that is still classified so uh okay yeah so someone with a much bigger platform than me hopefully will announce it one of these days but you know it can derail at any given time uh even even after they start shooting they can it can derail so i'm keeping my expectations very low so that in the off chance that it actually happens then i'll be i'll be pleasantly surprised we get get great uh support like from the the leadhead brigade you know we, we make it happen so uh, all right awesome make sure they go out they get your books uh, where can they 
where can I get the books right now? Pretty much everywhere, probably yeah. on Amazon. Everywhere, yeah. They get it on Amazon, local Barnes and Noble, local independent bookstore. Uh, it's out there in hardback. It's out there in audiobook. It's out there in ebook. And what I didn't know, because I'm not a really I wasn't an audiobook guy before, um, I didn't know that uh, people follow narrators around. <laughs> and luckily, I chose an amazing guy, Ray Porter. And he is absolutely incredible and brought a whole fan base to that audiobook. And it was uh, actually nominated for Audiobook of the Year last year. So it was up there with uh, Stephen awesome. King and Ruth Ware, like all these famous authors up there. And then there's the Terminal List up there, their first debut. Um, and it didn't win. But to be up there with those guys, that was just surreal, totally crazy. And Ray Porter is just an awesome dude. So just a great, great guy. That was so actually really one of our, our listener it. questions was, do you get to choose who narrates your books for the audio um, you know, I, I, my, my experience is very uh, limited, obviously. I'm just starting down this path. But uh, for me, they sent me, Simon Schuster sent me um, a sample you know, an afternoon before the first book came out and said, hey, what do you think of this guy? And I was like, oh, no, that does not sound good. So I wrote back, <laughs> I'm like, hey, uh, can I choose somebody else? And they said, yeah, sure, pick somebody. Who do you want? And I said, oh, hold on. And so I just started sampling and sampling and sampling and found Ray Porter and listened to a bunch of his different uh, di different samples from a bunch of different books that he'd done. Yeah. And then I wrote back and said, hey, can we get this guy? And they said, well, we'll ask him. And he agreed. So I um, just feel That's very awesome. fortunate that, uh, one, they can let I, me choose, and I, I got to pick that. somebody different, and that he said yes. So, like, can we get Sam Elliott? Beef. It's what's for dinner. <laughs> Great voice. Yeah. yeah. Great voice. I don't know if I can forward him, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did you write your book, or do you have an author do it? No, I wrote it. I had help from a, a friend, but I've, uh, I did not have a ghost writer do it. So yeah. it is uh, something I wanted to do since uh, I was a very little kid and uh, you know, read all these guys growing up, all these masters of the genre throughout the 80s and into the 90s, and then continuing to this day, really. But uh, those guys laid in the early education and storytelling for me, and my mom was a librarian, so I grew up surrounded by books and a love of reading, and I always knew I was going to do this. So it wasn't something I woke up one day and said, oh, you can make money at this? Maybe I'll give that a shot. It was something I wanted to do since I was a, a little kid, when none of that matters. Um, and luckily, I laid that foundation early, because if you were to go back and read some of those today with uh, kind of the baggage and the, the lens that you've built up over a lifetime of experience, it, uh, it might not have that same impact. And I have such great memories of reading those books uh, as a kid growing up. I can attach like where I was in the world and, and where I was in my development each time I read one of those. And I would just wait for a new David Morrell novel or a new Nelson DeMille novel, a new Tom Clancy to, uh, to come out and just dive into those pages and, and escape and learn. So, uh, so yeah, it was something that I've been passionate about since I was a little kid. Yeah. Did you have a mentor when you were writing? Not a mentor per se. No, I think I think those guys I mentioned from the '80s, whether they knew it or not, were essentially my mentors. They uh, gave me my early education in storytelling. And in uh, 1988, I watched a series of interviews on PBS called uh, "The Power of Myth," where Bill Moyers interviewed a guy named Joseph Campbell. And who was heavily influenced George Lucas, actually, for the Star Wars films. Mm -hmm. But uh, he talked about how the mythologies across culture share many similar traits from different to cultures that had never had any contact with one another. And typically, there's a hero's journey where the, it's a reluctant hero who goes on this journey. He's tested somewhere along the way, faces a crucible of sorts, and then emerges transformed. And usually ends up back home passing those lessons on. But um, but most of those most of the things, and you think back of the stories that you like to read, uh, the movies you like to watch. Um, you know, the, like we were just talking about Star Wars earlier with Han Solo. So you know, where does Luke go? He goes to the Dagobah system. Where does he go? He goes in, into the swamp. And who does he learn from? A mentor. Um, so typically, these stories also have a mentor, an older figure that passes on lessons along the way that Obi Wan that Kenobi, hero Yoda. Journey. So yeah. exactly. Yep. Even so Darth you think Vader. back to any of those. Uh, all of that. So it's uh, so that heavily influenced me too at a time when I was uh, uh, very impressionable, I would say, especially knowing the link to George Lucas. And then uh, I was studying like martial art type stuff, getting ready to go on the SEAL teams because that's what I wanted to do since I was a little kid. So it's uh, all those things kind of came together uh, at the right time and place and really lend credence and, uh, and really helped me as far as uh, writing these novels. Now, you mentioned all the, the people that influenced you. Um through your career here talk about how your work dif differs from say like a tom clancy or a thor or you know those guys what sets yours apart from theirs well tom clancy was very unique and there was uh, i mean there was a techno thriller before him but if you ask most people he really defined the techno thriller sure. um yeah. meaning it was very <laughs> very detailed and uh, very thick 
Uh, once again, you can use it as a doorstop or a weapon. Um, <laughs> but uh, so his are his stand out in that respect, of course. Um, yeah, but uh, the other books, kind of in that in the genre, if we move away from techno thriller and just into political thriller, usually those are about uh, probably half the length of a Tom Clancy novel, so around a hundred thousand words is how you uh, how you define one of those 105 110 maybe um but uh uh you know they're usually these do- novels do have a protagonist that has some sort of military experience and i from growing up i i never really liked it when they just had someone that didn't have law enforcement didn't have intelligence didn't have military experience thrown into a situation where all of a sudden he knows how to use all these weapons and build these bombs somehow and do all these things um i really liked it when they had that background they had that foundation um, so a lot of the protagonists in these stories um, typically do have backgrounds somehow in intelligence circles or special operations somehow. So um, what differentiates mine, I think, is that and what made it stand out to Simon and Schuster and what made uh, it resonate with readers is that I'm not just thinking about how I think this guy would feel in a certain situation. I'm thinking back to experiences downrange and I'm taking those feelings and emotions and applying them to a completely fictional narrative. But because they are real, they sound and they feel real to the reader as you're reading them. So, and I didn't expect that at the outset. I figured, you know, I got the technical stuff right and I'll, I'll really check with people who know what they're doing <laughs> if I've forgotten a few things along the way because I know people are going to check and expect it to be right. But at least there won't be safeties clicking off on a Glock or something like that. You know, I'll, I'll be able to avoid those ones. And then anything that I don't really know too, you know, as much of or that I've forgotten from sniper school or that's become you know, more of a science uh, over the years that I didn't get back in sniper school in 2000 or pick up along the way when I was actually doing it, um, I'll reach out to people that really know what they're doing to get that as, as accurate as as I possibly can, but uh, but really, it's those feelings and emotions I think that uh, are making it feel human, and and the characters human. A lot of times, the media portrays SEALs or other special operations forces as uh, these superheroes, yeah. and you know, really, we were just uh, guys doing a job, and that job happens to be special operations, and making a mistake can result in uh, in death for those for your friends and teammates. Um, so you take it very seriously, and you dedicate yourself completely to that craft. And the pendulum is 100% on the side of the team, on the mission of the guys you're taking down range, because that's what you owe them, their families, the country. Um, but now the pendulum has swung back the other way, and it's time to focus on my family, and I can take a little more time to to uh, craft these stories and um, and make them the, the best reads they possibly can for uh, for the audience. Yeah. Now, are you are you still going out to the range? You still getting some range time in? I get out as much as I can, but it's uh, man, it's been a sprint, and I didn't anticipate. Uh, all the the things that go along with writing. Like I was just saying, telling you earlier, I I thought you could live in a cabin in the mountains and just send a story in, and <laughs> that was it. But uh, there's all these other things involved in it as well, so I don't get to the range as much as I would like. But uh, I do get out as much as I can, and I uh, got the family out to FTW in Texas this uh, this last year. Got them on some uh, some long range type weapon systems, uh, get them more confident uh, in rifles, and um, so I do get out there as much as I can. But it's not as much as it was in the past, obviously, when yeah. uh, when it was my job. But uh, you know, I try to stay as uh, current as I possibly can, keep the skills up because I f- think that's my responsibility as a husband and father and citizen is uh, to be proficient with firearms and be able to to protect myself and my family and right those around on. me. Right on. I can only imagine uh, if you haven't already that you're going to be getting inundated by firearms companies to test out, try uh, their latest and greatest um, firearms. Yeah, yeah. There have been a few, and so far. There, actually, a couple of whiskey companies reached out to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've uh, I've said no to everything so far because I really want to just keep everything real, authentic. Don't want to be swayed. Like when people send things, you know, for free or whatever, I'll test them out. And if I like them, I'll sure. talk about them. And if I don't, I just won't talk about them. Yeah. Um, but I want to keep you know keep that trust because I think the part of this what, what's going going forward, what also differentiates this 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 brand and these stories is that I, you know I was a gear guy before I came in the military. I was always backpacking, running around, whatever. Um, so I was always up on layering systems and and lighter, better gear, so I could go deeper, farther, faster into the backcountry. Uh, right. The military when I first got there pre nine eleven, I was quite surprised at how far behind the military was and all this stuff, still issuing us cotton and not understanding layering systems and giving us horrible boots when you have a hard, a, bit, a large, uh, you know, a, a loaded pack on, um, ridiculous stuff. So I've always been a gear guy and I was going to shot show early on before it was, but when, when the tactical part of shot show yeah. was about as big as a, uh, I don't know, a small, a bedroom, um, <laughs> and everything else was hunting really all around it and fishing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and to watch that grow over the years, but I'd always go just so I could make sure that my guys had the best stuff possible 
going down range and it's something that i'm i, I love and and uh, it's just kind of a, a part of me so it's very natural for me to continue to do that in this next chapter in life and also incorporate that stuff into the pages of these novels so i want uh, people to be able to trust that and trust the authenticity of it and that they're going to get my honest assessment of things both in the pages of my the novels and in my interviews and social media presence which is very new also to me but uh, just in life in general. So I want to keep it very authentic, keep it very real. Uh, and that's important to me as we start off. And then you know, maybe that'll change down the line where I get sponsored or do something for somebody that, or sure. make it very clear that, hey, this is sponsored. Um, but I actually also <laughs> happen to use it. Uh, so yeah. I'm going to keep it a lot doing that. But for right now, I'm saying no to all that and just uh, keeping everything real and authentic. Well, that's that's exactly our model here at Talking Lead is, uh, you know, we don't push or promote anything that we don't personally use or have used and believe in. Yeah. I, I've know where you're coming from from that definitely charlie we should uh should get him out for the next shoot yeah definitely so uh, where do where do you live at jack so we moved uh, from uh, sunny southern california to uh park city utah so we're just outside of salt lake there so he was and right out there next to us clean, clean break oh, with yeah. the uh yeah. the military both uh you know psychologically and um physically so we wanted to raise our kids in a ski town and off we went so we're up in the mountains now so, yeah, I'm actually uh, I'm actually teaching a course in Utah uh, the twenty seventh, twenty first through twenty fifth. Oh, nice, nice. I think I'm I'll be in Russia doing some research on uh, book three. So I'm, oh, I'm nice. out of there. Sounds yeah, interesting. yeah. I try to weave a lot of the things like uh, for the second novel. I went to Mozambique and got to weave a lot of that local flavor into the pages of uh, book two, both as far as uh, you know, poaching, uh, Chinese influence, both legal and illegal mining operations. Get to talk to the trackers, the professional hunters, uh, just really get a, a, a sense of the land, uh, the dirt, the stones, the foliage, like all that stuff. I uh, get to weave in the local beer. Um, so I'm not sure what I'm going to find in, in Russia, but I'm heading to Kamchatka Peninsula so, and, uh, like things I want to find out there. Are like, Hey, what kind of snow machines do they use? Are they a, a crazy Russian snow machine? I've never heard of like snowmobile. Um, what does it sound like? Uh, what kind of drinks do they make their own vodka out there? Is it like, what, like all those little things that I don't even know, uh, right now, what I, are things that, uh, I'm going to weave, end up weaving into this. Now when you're doing your research, are you doing, novel. are you doing videos? Are you doing like you recording all these sounds and you, just, I mean, Took a lot of pictures. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's like Mozambique. And then I went back in, uh, last November to South Africa. I was invited back to help train up an anti-poaching unit out there because they'd never used M4s and Glocks. Um, I happen to be fairly proficient with those. So I uh, went out there for a couple of reasons. One, uh, because it's something I'm passionate about. But two, uh, because the third book is fairly tracking-centric. And not just the science of tracking, but really the psychology of tracking. It's always been very, um, something that's interested me and fascinated me. So I got to go meet with these guys. And I learned way more from them than they did from me. But a lot of these guys, they caught, they grew up tracking animals, of course. And then they caught the tail end of the bush wars. So they caught that kind of mid-90s tail end of the bush wars. In this case, it was in Namibia. And then after that, they came back and the government was like, well, what are we going to have all these you know, kind of unemployed people that have, have all this combat experience in man tracking and, and hunting humans. Now, what are we going to do with them? And a lot of them went to work for what we would consider CSI, for the National Police Force, so the crime scene investigation. Uh -huh. And so they'd go into these places and take that skills from tracking animals in the bush, then man tracking, and they brought those skills back to an urban environment. Uh, it's not just so that they're like tracking drips of blood away from a crime scene, but so that they can get in the mind of the suspect. Where is he or she going next? And, uh, and intercept them that way. And then they kind of aged out of that. So these guys are getting up there, and now they're being hired by a lot of these uh, private reserves to help protect, in this case, uh, rhino, some of the last remaining rhino on Earth. Mm -hmm. So they have all this experience, and now they're out there uh, being paid privately um, and to keep them loyal um, and protect some of these last rhino on Earth. So it's, uh, it's an amazing group of people. They put me through a tracking course, and I got to spend a week with them and ask a ton of questions and have some drinks and eat out under the stars in the African bush and just got a lot of information that I got to then throw into edits on book two because uh, I was still finishing up edits, and it also ma made it into the pages of book three that I'm putting the final touches on now. Nice. That sounds interesting. That's, is, but it's going to be tied in with the first two books, right? Okay. Yep. Yep. Okay. So it's a continuation of the story. And this third one is one that uh, I wanted to write since sixth grade, since I first read Most Dangerous Game. For those of you guys that have read that, it's a short story by Richard Connell written in 1923, really about manhunting. And I couldn't believe it in sixth grade that they were letting us read this stuff because it's awesome. And uh, I always wanted to write a modern rendition. Uh, so it's a, it's kind of a retelling of that story with the characters from the first two books and uh, today's geopolitics as the backdrop. 
Very cool. Very cool. Charlie, you were gonna ask you were asking a question, I think. Uh no, I don't think so. Okay. Uh, when he was talking about Russia, I thought you were trying to ask something. No. Nope. Oh no, yeah, I was trying to, oh no, he's talking about the the beer from Mozambique. I was like, did it have rust on the bottle cap? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I did look and some of them do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like Philippine beer. Yeah, All the bottle exactly. caps are rusted. <laughs> yeah, 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 you gotta you, you gotta be be, yeah, be aware. <laughs> Yeah, drinker beware, definitely. Uh, so we've got this line of questions that we ask our new guys. And uh, you're a new guy, so we're going to hit you with our new, new guy, guy, new guy, guy, new guy. guy. And sometimes a girl. Questions. All right. What, what's your earliest recollection of of shooting a gun, BB gun, Camp. whatever it may be? Yep, 22. But I know BB gun first, and then, uh, yeah, BB gun for sure. I have pictures of it, actually. Of me struggling to cock this thing back when I'm, I think, five years old. Um, so I have pictures of it, and then graduated fairly quickly to 22 single shots. Uh, and I wish I knew exactly what model it was, but shortly thereafter, it's uh, so shooting that was a Winchester model. I'm gonna mess this up, and I know I shouldn't even mention it because somebody out there is gonna know right away. Is it a 94, the pump action 22, um, old school from like the 1920s? Yeah, that sounds right. Yeah, I, I think so. Winchester anyway. 94, 94 is a lever action, isn't it? Is that the lever? Yeah, we have to look it up. But anyway, it's the pump action from like 1920 something, I think. Um, and so that was uh, what I graduated to next. So those are my those are my first memories of of shooting. Is that with that going out with your father, grandfather? My dad, yeah, and yeah, my grandfather killed in World War II. So unfortunately, I never got to to shoot with him. But uh, yeah, with my dad. World's first pump action Winchester Model 62 rimfire. 62. Okay. Is that the one that has the kind of octagonal barrel? There was one that came out there with the. There's there's a couple of them from back then, but anyway, yeah. uh, I still have it to this day. Still, uh, still have it. Oh, there you still and, have it. Nice. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I love it. It's uh, it's so cool. <laughs> now the second question has to do with your uh, military law enforcement background, which we know that you have. Uh, any anything else you want to add about your your service? Uh, it was a good long run. I mean, it was a good twenty year run, and feel honored to have done it as long as I did. Um, and, but also I feel good about moving on to this next stage in life to take care of my family and, uh, and move forward. So, uh, you know, it's obviously a big part of who I am, as you can tell by reading the, the novel, but it's also, but I don't live back there. Um, you don't live back in the past. It's part of what makes me hopefully a better writer and also a better, uh, husband, father and citizen. But, um, yeah, mostly it's, uh, I, I feel grateful, thankful, uh, to have been able to have had the opportunity to do that to serve my country because uh, a lot of places you're either forced into doing it or you cannot because um your your class or something else prohibits that uh, uh, but in this country we're given the options and opportunities to pursue whatever it is that we want to go after and that's because of the guys from the inception of this country to today right. that died to give us those, uh, those options and opportunities so i uh, just feel fortunate and that's about it america america baby so when it comes to pop culture what is your go-to, whether it's a, a movie, a TV show, a magazine, a book, uh, maybe even music, that uh, is just kind of your escape? Jeez, I do not escape these days. Um, <laughs> it is such a, man, I'm in a full-on sprint at all times. But uh, I do listen to, do listen to a lot of podcasts uh, in, in the car. Um, I've been flying everywhere recently and flying, I read. That's the time when I don't, I do not try to connect to the on flight Wi Fi ever. That's my one time to take a breath and not have any distractions whatsoever. So I'll read a book, uh, in the genre, one that somebody's asking me to blurb nowadays, mm -hmm. um, or one that I can just talk, want to read and talk about to help another author, um, that sort of thing. So, uh, I'm always reading, always trying to, trying to learn, always trying to, to, uh, do, do it better. So, um, yeah, I don't have one go-to, but uh, I'm always on the move. On the go. What what uh, what kind of podcast are you listening to? I listen to, to um, Rogan, of course. I think he's the first one I might have ever listened to. Uh, when I'm like, what's a podcast? Who? Right. What? Joe Rogan? <laughs> yeah. The guy from Fear Factor? What? Yeah. Um, so it was early in on, in on that. Love uh, Gritty Bowman, love Journal of Mountain Hunting. Um, a lot of the, like the hunting-centric ones gotcha. um, I listen to these days. Um, yeah, for, for whatever reason, that's from, I'm drawn to those. Very cool. I like Rogan too. Uh, I just listened to the one where he had the, uh, area 51 guy on. Um, I saw that. I want to check that out. It, it's a good, it's a good interview. It's very good. Nice. Uh, yeah, he's awesome. 
your next uh, bucket list got to have want to have what's what are you eyeing? Piece of kit? Oh my firearm, gosh! I change, like vehicle? Every, I change. Yeah, no, I change like every day. So I'm lucky I have a. Uh, in the I growing up in the '80s, every TV show I like has a had a uh, a car as a character essentially. You know, you had the Magnum Ferrari, you had the 18 van, you had the the Kit. two Ferraris on uh, on Miami Vice. Night you know, Rider. you had the the, the yeah. Night Rider, you had uh, yeah Dukes of Hazard, you had the Simon and Shine, Simon Dodge Ram. <laughs> you know, you had all that stuff. Yeah, exactly. So you had all that stuff. So I think it was very natural for me to also put a vehicle into the pages of the novel that I associate as almost as a character. And it's a character building tool. Um, but uh, the my 1988 Land Cruiser uh, ended up in the pages of the novel. Um, there's a whole subculture, of course, that's uh, oh, yeah. just dedicated to, uh, to Land Cruisers. And now mine's getting restored by the guys at, uh, at Icon up in uh, in L.A. area. Uh, so that'll be pretty sweet when that thing gets done. So that's, uh, I had, of course, uh, a, a must-have. I had Bob <laughs> Taylor on a- Taylor guitars. Oh wow! You know he's he's a big adventurer, land adventurer, and he's in he's nice. into those overland guy. Yeah, he's overland yeah. guy, and he's into the. No, I love that stuff. And then firearms wise, man, I sweat every day. Every time I see something, I'm you know it's like squirrel. You know, I just uh, <laughs> just just like, oh, I gotta have one of those. Gotta have one of those. What well, doesn't matter if it's an old you know old weapon or something brand new that's just coming out. Or I definitely want though uh, 38 super because Bob Lee Swagger from the uh, the Bob <laughs> Shooter by Stephen Hunt. Um, you know, he used that and, uh, that those books, I love those books. Stephen Hunter's amazing. He, he blurred my first novel and, uh, he's just a super guy. So point of impact, I think was written in 1993, I want to say. And, uh, of course bond a bunch of, uh, books, uh, based on it since and based on that character, but the 38 super, I think one that's worked on by Jason Burton at, uh, at heirloom precision out there in, uh, in Arizona. I think, uh, one of these days I will, uh, Pick out a appropriate thirty eight super for him to restore, and nice. uh, that'd be pretty awesome. I think. Yeah, e- EAA makes a badass one too. Oh, nice, I'll check that out. Arm. Okay, yeah. nice. They make good ones. Cool. I think so, it's called the witness or something. Laws, <clears throat> laws be damned, money be damned. Sky's the limit. What would you own? I am. You know, I would just not worry as much um, about yep. where these things are coming from. Yep. But, uh, yeah, it's not really about it, something I'd own. It was something I would do. Okay, um, that, that falls and, into it, yeah. Yeah, so I guess it's uh, it's twofold, and hopefully it's not getting too deep for everyone. Um, but, uh, yeah, our middle child is really uh, severe special needs and needs 24-7 full-time care forever. So I would uh, fund his special needs trust so that the, uh, the financial – burden of taking care of him does not fall to his brother and sister and if i get hit by a bus tomorrow that he will be taken care of so um that's what i'm in the middle of, uh, of doing right now is making sure that he's taken care of for a lifetime of full-time care so uh if, if that happened um and I'm, we're, we're we're gonna get there but uh yeah if money was not an option that's the first thing and then uh of course then i would help help uh through the what's called the national ability center out there in park city utah it was essentially it helps a lot of people with ptsd with tbi missing arms and legs from iraq and afghanistan but then just pick people of every age with uh special needs gets them outside gets them on horses gets them on bikes gets them on skis um it's an amazing place funded really by the marriott family and uh so i would make sure that that place is uh is uh, is all set up as well so that was, that's what i would do great answer good answer now, if you're being selfish, <laughs> if you're being I think selfish, I'd have a very, you? very large garage um, and, and walk in gun safe. Um, uh, but that garage would probably have a lot of uh, of overlanding type vehicles and uh, <laughs> the uh, yeah Land Cruiser FJ40 is restored, of course, 60s, 62s, uh, and then you got to do the Range Rover too. You know the Hell Defender yeah. 90, the Defender 110, the series, uh, which I also use as character development tools between two characters in book three. Uh, you know, one's a one's a Defender guy, the other's a Land Cruiser guy. One guy is the uh, he likes a 1911, loves uh, loves leather holsters. The other one's uh, more of you know polymer frame, striker fire with Kydex. So I use those things as character development tools, right. not just as things people use in a book. It really says a lot about what them, what they drive, um, and what they use, what they carry as knives, what they carry as for pistols. Um, so I use all that stuff really as characters. Nice. So I think I think I'll probably going to really connect with your book. So I'm I'm really looking forward to to getting this. I'm a, a kid of the '80s. Awesome. Also, I was born in '71. Uh, you nice. Know. You look so young. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> Whatever. Man, uh, it's clean living. Clean uh, living, I guess. These webcams, you know. It's, <laughs> it's got that it's, filter it's on. It's the mullet. 
Yeah, the, the mullet makes I've got the mullet different. pulled back though, Charlie. I've got it in a ponytail right now. Yeah. Nice. You got it back? Nice. Yeah, Good I got it, pulled, got it pulled back today. Um, but yeah, you I mean, bring, I grew up with <laughs> Magnum PI, you know, GI Joe. I mean, I was huge into GI Joe. Um, kind of time to grow up. Now that I'm on the social channels, as the kids say, uh, I do like Movie Monday where I typically grab a cool scene from something in the 80s and throw it up there for people to tie. And people really love it, yeah. which is uh, cool because it's uh, you know, obviously a very influential decade in my life. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, last question, and uh, you don't have to put a lot of thought into this, but uh, just first thing comes to mind. What uh, group of people, person, fictional, dead, still alive, who would you like to spend the day at the range with? Oh, that's a great question. Oh, man. One that I was not prepared for. I know as soon as we we, we leave this thing, I'm going to be like, ah. Oh, <laughs> like uh, the alive one? <laughs> that is live, dead, anything? Yeah, oh, yeah. man. Fictional. Gotcha. It could be that a group a of tough people. One. Yeah. You know, I probably want to, uh, uh, well, Hemingway would be great to drink with. So that's my, my first one. I'd love to meet him. Um, you know, a little closer to uh, before the end, maybe right. down in Cuba, and spend a little time fishing, drinking, and defending the coast uh, using his boat and that uh, that Thompson <laughs> submachine gun that you carry out there for sharks. Uh, Looking out for those uh, Nazi submarines. Exactly. Yeah, I think I would uh, go spend the day with him on the boat outside of Havana uh, in defense awesome. of the nation, drinking a couple of drinks. That's a great answer. That is. Nobody's ever said Hemingway before. That's a good one. I like that. Very good. It, we'll go you, with that. Do you, uh, Jason, Charlie, you guys got any questions you want to ask Jack? Um, I have one. Um, do you plan on expanding out uh, into a different books, or do you want to pretty much stick with the series in, in the near future, or do you have any plans on anything aside from the series? You know, I'm gonna, I think I'm going to stick with this as long as people are interested and uh, want to keep reading, and I don't think I'll ever run out of ideas. I have a lot of, uh, a lot of things to explore. And uh, I, right now, the plan is to continue with the series. Uh, and be, I get asked a lot about the nonfiction side. And, you know, I never had any intention to write any nonfiction. And I doubt I'll ever go that route. Certainly, I will not as far as uh, military type experience. Uh, if I ever did, it would be more about uh, the adversity we, fa we faced as a, a family with our middle child um, and have those proceeds go to the National Ability Center or something. But, uh, yeah, short well, short and long term, it's all about uh, yeah building this uh, this series and this character, and and uh, I love doing it, so I don't see uh, veering away from that anytime soon. Yeah, I got a question. So, with your time in the teams, who was your greatest influencer for like leadership and like mentor? Yeah, yeah, I'd have to say. Uh, I think you can say their names if they're got like an O five or above. I'm not sure though, so I don't want to. Anyway, um, oh yeah, never mind. You're right. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll say my, my CEO at Team 2, he spent the first year uh, after September 11th deployed to Afghanistan. So that was really the first time in a long time since Vietnam that we had been involved in um, uh, sustained combat operations. We'd had flashpoints at uh, Desert One, Grenada, Panama, Mogadishu, but we hadn't really been in sustained combat since Vietnam. So he spent that first year deployed over there and came back to be the CEO of Team 2. Uh, where I was a junior officer at the time, having just transitioned to the, the officer ranks. And he was, uh, whether he meant to or not, he had a huge influence on me and everybody else at the team, not just officers, but everyone at the team. And uh, he passed on a few a few things to us uh, from that year, uh, four things. And you can think of them really in terms of uh, yeah, tactical battlefield application, but they also apply, I think, in business and life in general, uh, if you think of them in the abstract. And he said, one, always improve your fighting position. Two, exploit all technical and tactical advantages. Three, push situational awareness, which is a military, fancy military way of saying information. Push situational awareness both up and down the chain of command. And four, and this was most important to me, in the absence of orders or direction on the battlefield, take charge and lead. So uh, he passed those on to us, and obviously I've never forgotten them, and I've passed them along to everyone I've worked with since. So I would say that he was uh, probably the most influential guy uh, that I met in the teams. Uh, during my 20 years. That's awesome. Yeah, there's a lot of good leaders in the team. It's crazy. Who was your star? Uh, I have a couple, actually. Yeah, I guess the warrant, uh, yeah, I guess I can't say names, but yeah. Uh, the warrant officer that kind of uh, started sniper school for the sales, he was, a, he was pretty badass. He was a stud. Cool. 
All right. I, I think that's uh, that's going to wrap it up. I know you've got uh, a lot of interviews to do. you got a book signing that you're getting ready to do down there in Florida. Tell us, yep. uh, tell tell our lead heads uh, where you're headed next. Where where might they get an opportunity to to get you to sign one of their books? Yeah, so the best way is probably to go to the website and check it out, so I don't miss up any uh, times, locations, dates, that sort of thing. <laughs> best way is to go to the website and check out Book Tour because there are a few stops left. Uh, and even if you can't make one, and if you want something signed, you just call ahead to one of those bookstores, and I'm more than happy to personalize it. But uh, officialjackcar.com is the website and for people that want a little deep dive uh, a little more into the weapons uh to the knives to the gear that sort of thing uh, you can deep dive a little more on that site so officialjackcar.com and then uh also they can find out tour dates and a bunch of other stuff on the social channels and that's uh jack car usa and it's me on instagram me on twitter it is not me on facebook things just repost from instagram because for a person that is so new at this that was just too much three was way too much so it's uh <laughs> it's me on instagram me on twitter and uh and the the facebook is just the repost but jack car usa on those so um yeah look forward to to seeing you guys out there very cool jack i would love to have you on the show and just have you talk about our normal stuff you know guns knives and gear um Sure. As well, when you when you get an opportunity, I know you're you're slam jam packed right now. Um, Sounds good. Sounds good. I love all that stuff. It's definitely a, a part of uh, a part of who I am, and uh, I'm more than happy to do it. You're, you're welcome back anytime. Thank so, you. Thank you for having me on, Jason. You want to wrap? You want to wrap up the show? Yeah. Say so thanks to having Jack on. Uh, Jack, I appreciate you coming on, and uh, I love the books. Um, looking forward to True Believer, and. Uh, Thanks for coming on. We appreciate it. Great guest. Thank you, guys. Really appreciate it. Charlie, thank you for taking the time to be on. Also, make sure you go and support those that support the Talking Lead podcast, Keltech, keltechweapons.com. Don't forget that we've got a CP33 pistol that we're going to be giving away. Details of that coming up soon. X-Steel Targets. Got a nice set of X Steel Targets gongs that we're also going to be giving away. Modern Spartan Systems. Check them out at modernspartansystems.com. They have also put up two of their Modern Spartan System cleaning kits and a bottle of their TVT engine oil additive that we're going to be giving away. Dually Defense has put up a 22 silencer from Rebel Silencers. 1776 United, the official swag of Talking Lead. Get her t shirts, get her patches at 1776united.com. Dipstick Hydrographics. Check them out at dip123.com. The leddies are going to be re-released. We've got some new leddies that we're going to make available soon. So be listening to the show. I'll let you know when those are ready. We're going to have a a new logo on those and a little different design. You're really going to like them. The Talking Letty, the Evil Black Assault Mug, Better than a Yeti, get yourself a talking Letty. Don't be a snowflake. We've got one more of the ASP USA XTDF kits, flashlight kits that we're going to be giving away. And you guys go back and listen to the previous episodes on how to be eligible to win all these awesome prizes that we're giving away. These are all in conjunction with our 300th episode uh, giveaway celebration. Been giving away random Letties. If you haven't got your Letty yet and you won one, they're on the way. I haven't forgot about you. Be looking for those coming soon. Rats Tourniquets, we're going to be giving away. Good buddy Jeff Kirkham over there at Rats Tourniquets has uh, put up several of those for you leadheads to win. And Glock, we've got two more of those $75 gift cards to give away. And don't forget to let me know if you want to be on the live show they're going to be doing to narrow down our nominations for the Lead Force One Pilot. Talk about it at gmail.com. Let me know if you'd like to be on the show, be a part of that. And then for all your Jack Wagon nominations and your Lead Force One nominations, you can email those to me at talkingled at gmail.com and just put either Jack Wagon uh, or Lead Force One in the, the subject on those. So go show all the sponsors and friends of the show some love. Like them on the social media pages. When you order products from, from them, let them know that you are a leadhead. We've got discount codes set up. Uh, the ones uh, come to mind right now, Modern Spark Systems. We have the TLCP15. You're going to get 15% off all your orders at Modern Spark Systems. Plus, they're going to kick in an additional 15% to donate towards Camp Patriot. Make sure you're taking advantage of that discount code. 
and then uh, ASP set up one for you guys several episodes back on all their flashlight and flashlight accessories. It's code LED20. You go to ASP USA and you're going to get 20% off all their flashlights and flashlight accessories. Uh, and then, of course, the other sponsors and friends of the show, if you go to their website, typically it's just code LEADHEAD. You can try that. If it doesn't work, let me know. Uh, sometimes those expire and we have to just get them to renew them. Uh, but really appreciate all the support, all the participation from you LEADHEADS, and I want to see more of it. Let's keep it going, continue it. Let's grow the LEADHEAD Brigade. Guys, that does it for another episode of the Talking Lead Podcast. So until next time, lead heads, keep your loved ones close. And your firearms and books closer. And not just any book, The Terminal List and True Believer. Well, that was, I'd certainly appreciate that. By Jack Carr. <laughs> <laughs> those, those would be good choices. <laughs> <laughs>